This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at thebatmanuniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. In 2008, a podcast was created with one goal. To bring Bat fans around the world news related to movies, comics, video games, television, merchandise, and so much more. And now, the Batman Universe Podcast has returned. Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of the TVU Podcast. I'm Dustin and joining me today is BJ and we are here to discuss... All things related to Batman Universe, but more specifically, this time around, we're doing a lot more DC stuff. As promised last week, uh, we were intending on doing the Black Adam um, review last week, and I'll be honest, it was it was on me. Um, I had yet to see the film. I was unable to go opening weekend. I just had too much stuff going on with work and family stuff, so it just didn't happen. But I was able to watch it today, so we're going to be talking about Black Adam and giving you that review that we we promised you guys. Uh, hopefully you guys did check out last week's episode, even though it wasn't the Black Adam review, because we did, in fact, post a new, uh, a new, um, a new special podcast uh, with uh, Scott talking with Wires Don't Talk, um, s- discussing their top five Batman the Animated Series theme songs. So be sure to check that out if you haven't. Uh, but this time around, we have Black Adam. Uh, that's the newest thing. But lo and behold, right as we were about to record and we were uh, in the process of getting ready to record last week and we were thinking about what we were going to be talking about outside of Black Adam, there was some big news that released um, related to the future of DC in film, television, and animation, which we will talk about in a little bit. But before that, there was a little bit of a couple updates that were released regarding some of the upcoming Batman TV series that are coming to HBO Max in the future. Uh, The first one is we've gotten some more news about the potential Arkham Asylum series. Uh, This series, which, if you remember correctly, when they first announced the stuff that was coming to or I guess spinning out of the Batman. Uh, The first project that we heard about was a GCPD series. And they said it was going to follow the the, the Gotham Police Department and see see from their side of it how they react to the Batman existing within their universe. And as time progressed, there there was creative people attached to it, and they ended up leaving. At one point during promotion, promoting the film before it released, Matt Reeves had said on the record that the film had, or the not the film, the show had kind of like morphed into less focus on the GCPD and more of a focus on Arkham Asylum. And that's honestly the last thing I, I honestly remember hearing anything about this series was that that was that was what it was going to be was more of an Arkham Asylum series, but there was no other news. And then obviously all the news that we did see here since then has been related to the Penguin series with Colin Farrell, and that's that's basically the only series we've really heard any news. So at one point we know that there was potentially three different series if if you consider the GCPD series its own thing and not happening because there was creatives attached to that who have left. But now they've announced that the Arkham Asylum series is at least semi-moving forward because they have tapped the Staircase, which was a uh, limited series on HBO Max. The creator behind that, Antonio Campos, uh, as the new showrunner for this new series. Um, there isn't a whole lot of other details 
um, specifically um, about this. The original news uh, came from Variety, and they specifically said that Campos will direct and serve as the showrunner executive producer on the series if the show ultimately goes forward, even though... It is not. There's no. There's no specific series commitment to the series at this point. So, what do you think about the potential of this Arkham Asylum series actually potentially getting getting to move forward? Well, it's obviously a big step uh, to get the showrunner and director. That's obviously probably outside of casting. That's the most important thing you need someone to drive the show and create episodes weekly. I am excited. I think I'm still. I think a lot of us are still kind of in the dark. We really don't know what this show is going to be. I think it could be cool, um, like exploring the world of Arkham because we in the Batman we only didn't see much of Arkham really. We just saw two, just the two cells, two cells with the Joker and the Riddler. So I, it would be cool to see what else is going on in there. And I think. I wonder if there's an outside chance that they could just almost combine the GC PD show and the Arkham show into just one, meld those together. What do, what do you think about that? Do you think that would something we could see? It is, I think, something that's possible. I will say the idea of an Arkham Asylum series is interesting because it gives the ability to focus on a lot of like no-name villains that would never in their right mind show up in any way except for maybe a cameo in the films. So that idea is a good idea. As far as it combining with the GCPD, I, I definitely think that there are aspects that could carry over from the original idea of what they were trying to do with the GCPD, where maybe not only do we see what's happening inside of Arkham, but also some of the police that are bringing some of these criminals to Arkham or transporting them or doing whatever, where it's not necessarily needing to focus on, let's say, Jim Gordon or some of the other big names that we know, like Harvey Bullock or Rene Montoya, there's not necessarily a necessity to have those characters feature because they could just feature characters that are original for this series that just are part of the GCPD, but give a different side of you know what this series could be outside of just being a villain show. Um, but I do like the idea of a villain show regardless because I think that there's a lot of characters that could be used in a way where there are very minor roles um, that could be what be that could be done well so much better than what we saw in Gotham. Yeah, we could definitely see like I could totally see someone like Calendar Man's in there, and we uh, there's a whole episode or a couple episodes with him, and he could be someone that's like from pre Batman, like he's some criminal who's locked up there before there was even a Batman, the GCPD locked him up and he's just been like, he maybe he's Arkham's oldest inmate or something like that. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of possibilities with the villains and I think that it'll be cool to see what happens. I really do hope something like this moves forward. I think the fact that we're hearing about this series before we really hear about a lot of other projects at the moment uh, shed some light on what their focus is uh, while they're basically waiting to get the the sequel out for the Batman. I think we're going to be seeing you know a lot of filling in the gaps with these other series, which I have no issue with whatsoever. And speaking of other, these the series that are going to be filling the gaps, the Penguin series is the other one, and there was some pretty big news related to the Penguin series. They cast uh, Sophia Falcone. Um, who's going to be playing a major role in the series, and she's going to be played by Kristen Milioti, Um and she previously had done Made for Love, which was an HBO Max series recently. She's worked on a variety of different projects, but uh, she has been cast as Sofia Falcone, the daughter of, obviously, Carmine Falcone, um, who was played by John Turturro in the film, and Sofia is going to be fighting with the Penguin for control of the city. Um, there, that, that's all the information that we have, uh, for the character, but I would assume that she's going to be playing a pretty major role if she's going to be fighting with Penguin for control of the city, because it, it's basically Penguin's, you know, counter, um, to, you know, to what he's trying to achieve is like, this is his protagonist. Yeah, I saw her. I, the only thing I've ever seen her in is um, How I Met Your Mother. Uh, she comes in in that final season. Uh, she's the mother, spoilers. But And I was kind of taken aback seeing that she was casted as Sophia Falcone because in the comics, not that everything has to be 
perfect like the comics, but in the comics, Sophia Falcone, she's kind of, uh, she's like a bigger woman almost, and uh, this actress playing her, uh, is, she's a kind of, she's smaller, much smaller, so that kind of, I did like a double take seeing that, but I'm excited for it. I, once you start getting this casting going, all of a sudden, uh, it's kind of can get excited about uh, what we're going to get with the Penguin show. Yeah, and if you're looking for something out there to check out to see her range, uh, check out the the film Palm Springs. That's a really good movie that she was in. Um, I saw it a a while back. I think it's on Hulu, if I remember correctly. Um, But definitely try try to check that out. She's also in a thriller series called The Resort, which is over at Peacock. Um, If you want to check out even more of her stuff. And then obviously, like I said, Made for Love over at HBO Max. So that's the the news related to the Batman universe. Now we get to some huge news that I honestly did not see coming. October 25th, it was announced that uh, they they have found their Kevin Feige. Or I should say Kevin Feige's. Because there's two of them. Um, James Gunn and Peter Safran are going to be leading the film, TV, and animation division called DC Studios. They are the co-chairs and co-CEOs of a the new studio um, that is going to, and they're going to report directly to David Zaslav, and uh, they take the spot of former DC Films boss Walter Hamada, uh, who departed the week prior, um, and they're going to be basically taking on a lot of they're going to be heading up. They're essentially becoming the Kevin Feige's of over at Warner Brothers for the DC projects. Um, It's interesting because uh, out of the announcement, there was a couple of things of note. The first one was that they took uh, they, they they took over the jobs as of November 1st, which as we're recording, this is the day we are recording this. Um, They, so they're now in their roles. Um, I'm not exactly sure timing wise, what the point of that was other than weirdly when this announcement came out, it was just literally days after black Adam released in theaters. Um, the big thing for me is that not only are they going to be overseeing movies, but they're also going to be overseeing television and animation because for the most part, animation has kind of only has always been its own thing where it does its own thing as part of Warner Brothers animation and they don't really do they don't necessarily tie in or have anything to do with the other projects that are going on occasionally you'll see a animated film release around the same time as a video game releases that ties into it or is loosely connected to it uh, Salt on Arkham is one of them that comes to mind but there, generally speaking, there's not uh, there's not typically a lot of animation that crosses over to the other stuff. You've obviously got the Harley Quinn animated series. There's obviously the Batman Cape Crusader series that's somewhere out there, and there's other projects out there that have. Well, I mean, there's also obviously Bat Wheels, which we just talked about a couple episodes ago. But there's there's a lot of different projects, not as many as there has been in the past. There's Young Justice, um, which I don't recall if they got picked up for yet another season or not but i know that they had a a season that wrapped up this past year um but there is dc projects but my point is they don't typically have anything to do with the other aspects of warner brothers they have nothing to do with the film studios they have nothing to do with television and they have nothing to do with you know the the main branch of what they create when it comes to dc content typically is only done by warner brothers animation it's not to say that there are some producers that are involved in certain things but for the most part they're generally disconnected the other side of this is television because television has been completely disconnected from everything um for the arrowverse shows that has been its own little universe and then there's this other group of shows like peacemaker and titans that have very little to have anything to do with those other series um the other arrowverse series and the it's you can tell that there's there's a movement coming. A lot of the Arrowverse shows have wrapped or will be wrapping. Uh, there's not very many left. Um, I don't think that they're gonna. They, they just announced that Star Girl's ending. They've got uh, Su- uh, Lois Superman and Lois, which I they're they're waiting on to find out whether or not that's going to get picked up for another season. Um, the Gotham Knights series, which I think none of us are looking forward to, is very likely not going to happen just because of some sh- the shakeup that's been happening over at the CW, where we might see the 13 episodes, but it might immediately get canceled, and that's it. Um, 
but obviously there's films and there's there's films in in play there that are in the pipeline already but with this new group in charge there's going to be some very interesting takes on what we're going to see coming out of the new DC studios yeah James Gunn he's he's the big one he's the big get I think there's very few people that have uh a lot of goodwill like when it comes to like comic book twitter and social media and i think james gunn's one of those guys and like he went over to marvel and he was at marvel and he maybe i know i'm kind of known for my sports references here but he kind of maybe he picked up some notes uh from the great coach kevin feige and he's coming over to a new team and he's gonna try to implement some new stuff like some stuff that he's learned and some stuff that he wants to do and I do I think James Gunn's going to direct like a Superman? Maybe not, but I think he'll pick like the right person or find the right director who's a fan of Superman and put that him in a position to succeed. And I think you said in our uh, group chat that there's probably going to be a lot of deep cuts cuz uh, we know James Gunn is uh he's a big comic book fan. He's uh he loves the ragtag like Easter eggs the stuff we never saw coming like look what he did with suicide squad and guardians of the galaxy and peacemaker like those are whoever thought those would be billion dollar franchises and he's kind of uh he's kind of made that happen yeah there's there's gonna be some definitely deep cuts i mean i don't think anybody would have ever assumed that polka dot man would have ever ended up in a live action film <laughs> no and not, and, and Starro, not like, yeah exactly and, and not as a small you know, cameo role, like actual full-fledged member of the Suicide Squad. I don't think a lot of people saw that. The other side of this is Peter Safran. Now, that name doesn't is is not going to necessarily ring as many bells as James Gunn, but Peter Safran has been connected to the DC films for a while now. Um, going back to Shazam, he's been involved with that. He was also involved with Aquaman. He was uh, he worked with James Gunn on the Suicide Squad and the Peacemaker series. He has been involved with other DC projects, but it, it's interesting because so. Those of you who are unfamiliar with the world of Hollywood and how business works in Hollywood, I'm not going to claim that I am any sort of expert, but when it comes to some of the most successful companies and like their times when they are the most successful, you've got two types of people. You have the creative side people who are extremely involved with making sure that everything is very creative, and then you have the people who are very good at running a business. And when you pair two people like that together, it's almost they're almost unstoppable. And I say this because there's a bunch of different people over the course of the history of Hollywood that have that, that this has worked. Um, one of the most famous pairings is Walt Disney and Roy Disney, his brother. Roy Disney did all the behind the scenes, figured out how to make all the crazy ideas for Walt Disney to to make them work by getting the funding for them. Uh, you know, Disneyland would have never happened if it wasn't for the br brilliant idea of Walt Disney, but also the mastermind behind the scenes of Roy Disney coming up with the ways of how to get it funded. So that's one pairing, but there's other pairings. Another one at Disney was uh, um, Wells and Eisner at Disney as well. That was another famous pairing and unfortunately wells died in a in a plane crash or a helicopter crash i can't remember i think it was a plane crash um and eisner kind of fumbled after that because he was always about the creative side but never about the business side and when he had a focus on the business side it just didn't work so i like to see this pairing because peter safran has obviously produced some of these other films he's worked on the business side of these things and then pairing him with a creative person like James Gunn, you know that there's a good possibility that they're going to get some stuff done. Now, the one catch that I found interesting in this all is that this deal is only for four years. Uh, that's not to say that it can't extend and can't continue past the four years, but their initial deal is for four years. Now, when you think about it in the terms of like putting out live action films, that is not a lot of time. Um, Honestly, just thinking about it from t November of 2022 until November of 2026, when four years is up, you've got next year, we've got The Flash, Shazam, Aquaman coming out. The following year, we've got the Joker uh, film from Todd Phillips. Maybe 2025, 2026, you've got the Batman. There's possibility of, you know, maybe um, some other project from Gunn because he's been saying he's has another project that he wants to work on. Um, there's not exactly a, a ton of time. 
Uh, you got the Blue Beetle project. I, I know we've talked about these projects like a ton of times recently, but there's not a lot of time. Like generally, from the moment of getting a, a you know a project in pre-production, getting it in production, getting it in post-production, then actually getting it released, you're looking at sometimes like in the neighborhood of like three or four years. So it's not exactly a ton of time to make stuff happen. Now, that's not necessarily true of animation. Animation does take longer to produce, but to get the ball rolling, especially on projects that have already, you know, been, you know, have already had some sort of uh, pre-production elements put together like Cape Crusader or even like the Damian Wayne Christmas special that they were of, that they were talking about before those projects could still happen in in this new world of DC Studios. Um, you look at television; television can move very quickly. Um, you're talking, you know, quality, high quality television. It's it's generally about a year to put to to put something together, to film it, and then to release it. Um, as long as there's not an insane amount of effects, but. Uh, the not so high quality, like the mid mid range stuff, you could put out in like six months. So it's entirely possible that other stuff could happen. But it's a question of what will they be able to do in four years? Yeah, I think another um, thing uh, to think about with James Gunn, like a lot of we've seen with these DC movies, like studio interference and directors getting their movie kind of taken away from them. We start with um, Snow. Snyder and David Ayer's Suicide Squad. And I think with Gunn being a director, like I'm sure he would, if that ever, a studio ever interfered with his movie, he would cut, he would lose it. So I think it's that the directors now, they're going to have the full backing of like, we're really not going to kind of interfere with your movie. This is your vision. And I think we're going to see some really um, great movies coming in a few years. And I never knew that Walt Disney had a brother. So that was breaking news to me of Roy Disney. Um, but yeah, I think this is you got the business and the creative, and if they're all on the same page and they're all working step by step, I think uh, it's ex- finally it's exciting to to be a DC movie fan. I agree. Um, it's it's one of the things that I think I'm most excited for in a long time when it comes to the DC films, television, animation, everything DC related, because we actually at least there is a plan in place to do something you know there's no word on what exactly everything how everything's going to happen but there's there's something happening and there's a direction that can at least be followed you know i can't sit here and say that for sure james gunn and saffron are gonna you know write the ship and everything's gonna go perfectly because there's no guarantees but at least at the moment i feel like there's a, a level of um desire from the parent company to make sure that this works by doing this and i think that the people that they put in charge i think it's a good combination of 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 uh executives with james gunn and peter saffron to make sure that this is has the best potential it can um so i'm I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with this um so piggybacking off of the dc news the big thing that came out in the last two weeks was black adam uh, and before uh, we're going to kind of jump here because this ties into what we were just talking about. And I want to talk about this first, but the very, the biggest news probably out of black Adam is that the mid credit scene brings back Henry Cavell as uh, Superman. And it's, it, he's in full costume. It's actually him. He doesn't have, you know, his mustache. Um, and it's not somebody else just wearing the suit. It's his full head's on not him. cut off. Yeah, exactly. Like Shazam. Yeah, so he's back, and not only is he back, but then after the the film released, he actually uh, went on social media and made a post, basically saying that this is this is just the beginning. He is back, and he's looking forward to seeing what happens in the future. So, it, whatever happened behind the scenes, not necessarily, and I do not give credit to anything with what we just heard with James Gunn and Peter Safran, but. Something happened behind the scenes to get him to be back interested in one way or the other. Um, no knowledge exactly on what that could have been. I know that uh, Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, who obviously played Black Adam, he was very, very big on the idea of Superman and Black Adam facing off, or at least you know having some sort of fight in the future. 
I remember him talking about that like way early on before they even had a date for the film and things like that. That was one of the things that I remember him saying he was super pumped for is like, I want Black Adam to meet Superman. And, you know, like when you have the backing of a mega star like Dwayne Johnson in your film and you really want to make something happen in the future, um, this is what happens. So the the other, this has nothing necessarily to do with the DC Universe, but conveniently the other major project that Cavell is working on right now is The Witcher. And literally days after he announced that he was coming back as Superman, and I'm not saying this is related, but it, it was announced that he has been replaced on The Witcher for the upcoming season. Um, Liam Hemsworth is taking over as the main character in the show and Henry Cavell is going to be leaving. I believe that's going to happen with season four. Um, so not the season that I believe has that, that they, they just filmed, but he's leaving the series, which means, you know, in terms of DC universe, that means he might have a little bit more time for other projects that are DC related or obviously more specifically Superman related. There was some rumors last summer about him filming some scenes for the flash and Aquaman, but there was no, it wasn't as, um, as there wasn't as much proof as there was about like Ben Affleck returning for scenes for, um, obviously we knew he was returning for scenes for flash, but uh, there was that scene that he that he was filming for Aquaman that he was coming back for. Uh, there was nothing for Superman that that made its rounds like that. So maybe it's possible that he is, you know, he is going to have some scenes. Or I mean, there's obviously still time between now and then that he could show up. But I think overall, it's it's nice to see Cavell back in the role of Superman. Um, whatever happened behind the scenes prior to everything that happened. Um, with him, you know, potentially not coming back and doing things. I'm glad it's been resolved. I don't know if it had something to do with what happened with the Snyder cut or whether it had to do with something else. But when you look at, I, I, I see this, I, I don't want to get, you know, the Snyder cut people to, you know, uh, coming at us with the pitchforks or anything, but, um, I, I have to wonder because when you sit here and you you look back at like all the stuff that's happened over the past, let's say, five years since Justice League originally released, you look at the five years preceding, you've got the Joss Whedon cut happening, the film releases, it doesn't get very good reviews, fans aren't huge fans of what's happening. Then later on, like a year later, a lot of the um, – Actors and actresses that were involved with the project are saying, well, we support Zack Snyder's vision. That's what we were really looking forward to, blah, blah, blah. And then the Snyder Cut eventually releases, um, you know, in, what was it, 2020 uh, or 2021? I think it was early 2021. Um, The Snyder Cut releases on HBO Max. And... Weirdly enough, that Snyder Cut releases and none of those actors or actresses outside of, let's say, Ray Fisher with Cyborg has really been talking about the Snyder Cut in any way, shape, or form. Since then, you've got a new Wonder Woman film that came out. Henry Cavell is now coming back as Superman, and he wasn't involved with anything up until this point with Black Adam. You had Ben Affleck, who uh, left a project that he was going to write and direct as Batman and completely then said he was leaving the role 100% to then showing up in subsequent films and having, you know, roles in films like flash. Um, and now obviously Aquaman as well. So it's, it's weird how things have panned out because it almost is like they weren't happy with how justice league, uh, you know, was received. They were kind of like ticked about it. And maybe some of the cast was like, you know what, I don't really want to have to be associated with this stuff that's like falling apart. And then the Snyder Cut eventually gets released. Yeah, the people who were looking forward to it, they enjoyed it. And the people who didn't care one way or the other, they may have enjoyed it or they may not have cared anymore. So the thing is, but in the large scheme of things, it wasn't like the Snyder Cut releasing bolstered any of these actors or actresses, you know, uh, profiles in any way. I mean, if anything, them going and doing other projects has bolstered their profiles by themselves. So it has nothing to do with necessarily the DC stuff. So to see kind of how everything's happened and how there was so much support for the Snyder Cut and now we're getting away from the Snyder Cut, but yet we are having a lot of the actors and actresses still involved in projects, it's just interesting to me. 
Yeah, such a uh, weird winding road, uh, especially for Cavill coming back as Superman. I was I was pumped to see him um, step through that smoke wearing the wearing the big blue with the big red S. Um, I was pumped to see. I know my wife was pumped. She's a big Henry Cavill fan. Uh, I'm, just, I'm sure a lot of women are. But hey, whatever whatever gets her to come with me uh, to see a comic book movie, I'm down for that. And um, yeah, I saw. I thought The Rock had an interesting post where I think he shared Cavill's post, and he said like, "We kept fighting for y- for you, but they kept saying no." Almost like kind of one last uh, smack at the old regime, uh, like pinning it on the old regime, which kind of makes sense. I mean, I remember hearing that Cavill went to Warner Brothers with an idea for a new Superman movie, and they kind of pushed it aside or ignored it. So I'm happy he's back. I'm happy for the future. I saw today that he was saying how he wants to bring Superman back and make like uh, fans in the theater believe that they can fly. And that was the old tagline for the Christopher Reeve movie, which is a beloved classic. And... Yeah, I'm pumped. I'm pumped to have Superman back. It's crazy how Superman's the godfather of all comic book characters that we needed. We needed Black Adam and The Rock to like bring him back to the forefront almost and get him back to having a solo movie, which eh, it's, that's the world we live in. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about Black Adam. Um, so Black Adam released. Um, if you have yet to see it, obviously, we're going to be diving into some spoilers. So spoiler warning there. I guess I should have said that before we talked about Henry Cavill, but let's be honest, uh, that news was all blasted over social media uh, the weekend it came out. So you probably already knew that. And The Rock himself, was he he spoiled it even before the film actually released in theaters. So, you know, to each their own. But as far as the rest of the film, um, so Black Adam is a in some ways an origin story for Black Adam, but also sets Black Adam back into the present day after talking about how he came to be. Um, The Justice Society is included with members including Hawkman, Dr. Fate, Adam Smasher, and Cyclone. Uh, The big bad villain that's in the film is, uh, well, I guess you could say it's Black Adam for the first part, at least in the eyes of the Justice Society. Um, But then it's very clear that there's a hidden agenda with some of the characters. And then there is a a character called Sabak, who is the kind of like a hell demon. I don't know what DC has with these hell demons, but there's a lot of them. Um, But um, yeah, Um, what did you think of... Let, let's start. Let's start uh, smaller. What do you think? How, how, what do you think of uh, Dwayne Johnson as Black Adam? I liked it. I thought that it kind of everything that we've been kind of expecting from The Rock as Black Adam is what we got. Um, it's it's an action movie. He's an action star, and I didn't expect some like in the Batman. We get like this three hour mystery. I didn't expect that with this movie. I expected. Kind of what we saw in the trailers, a little more big explosions, big explosions, big fights, big punches. And I think that's um, that's what I expected. I think that's what we got. I agree. I think that is exactly what I didn't. I will be honest. I did not expect very much going into this. And I'm not saying that in any in, in a bad way. I'm saying that as I didn't expect this to be some sort of like mind melding, you know, you know, film. I didn't expect it to be as high quality as some of the Marvel films or as, um, as interesting or as thrilling as the Batman was earlier this year. But I think that as an action film, I think Dwayne Johnson did a great job. Um, I think that he played the role very well. I think the only hiccup that I had was when they tried to take the rock's head and put it on a small person's body. It just, it, <laughs> yes, it just, that, didn't, it didn't that, work very well. That gave me like uh, Captain America: The First Avenger vibes mm-hmm. with, um, with Chris Evans. I was like, and they really didn't try to hide it in the beginning because um, it was just his voice, so we knew that was him. So yeah. it was just very, it was very strange. But yeah, I think that was the only hiccup that I had. But I mean, like, as far as the effects go, uh, they were really good compared to um, just other action films in general. But even when you compare it to the other films in the genre, like uh, other superhero films, specifically Marvel films, I think the effects 
were on par and in some cases better than some of the stuff we've seen recently from Marvel. It's weird because I saw this interview recently about uh, Marvel having some problems with like some of their VFX studios that they work with because of COVID. Everything was delayed and there was a lot of issues with like not getting stuff as high quality as you expect. And when I believe it was Doctor Strange as well as Thor when they released earlier this year, there was some uh, social media buzz online about how the effects weren't that great of quality and there was it was questionable why they were doing that considering they make as much money as they do and I think it has to do with the fact that Marvel just did not want to have to push back the films. If you look at the DC films, they've all gotten pushed back and there was an interview that was done with the director of Black Adam and he specifically said when they were looking at how they were going to try to get the film released in July, they realized very quickly when they were dealing with the the uh, VFX, there was no way it was possible for them to hit that July release date with the VFX um, having the issues that they were doing. So they, they chose to push it back because of that. Now, that's not to say that the other DC films were purposely pushed back because of that too. We don't know that for sure. But the director of Black Adam said that that was the case. But I thought that I didn't honestly see anything other than the whole rock head thing on the small person's head. But that's more of a, I am not used to seeing the rock's head on a small person's body. Um, but it, it wasn't as bad as like, let's say, covering up a mustache on a certain person's <laughs> face. So. Yeah, it was, and I think they probably, I mean, the whole movie takes place in kind of one setting, really. So it's not like they were, like, build, building and breaking down sets left and right. The whole movie basically takes place in Condock. So I'm sure they kind of had a little more to spend on the VX. I know there was one kind of nitpicky with um, Dr. Fate when he has his helmet off and he still has his suit on. It kind of looks like his head's pasted on, but it was, like, a five-second, like, little clip. But, yeah, I had no problem with the effects. Yeah. So, let's see. Talking about the Justice Society, um, I, I thought that Dr. Fate, Pierce Bronson, perfect. I had no issues whatsoever with the portrayal or how it all ended up um, with that character. Um, Hawkman, I liked the character. I wish they would have at least acknowledged what was, you know, where Hawkgirl was because... In my mind, Hawkman and Hawkgirl are synonymous. They're not necessarily needing to be together on the screen, but at least a mention of, you know, his his soulmate would have would have been great. Adam Smasher, um, I mean, he's kind of a goofball, which is fine. I mean, they set it up in a way where he was just coming into the role of Adam Smasher. He inherited from his grandfather so like i i understand where they were coming from he was kind of like the new kid on the block um cyclone i thought I, I don't know anything about that character i quite honestly didn't even know all of a character named cyclone until this film was coming out and i, I thought i it. thought it was red tornado like i thought she was like a red tornado's like daughter or something i didn't for some reason yeah she was doing yeah so because she was doing some stuff like that and then she yeah, even she said was... the thing about the nanobots in her blood but i i did nothing i knew nothing about it and i thought the actress portrayed her did a great job i thought the the character itself was fine um i honestly didn't really have any complaints about the justice society other than the um the 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 weird sequence in the beginning where he's kind of like saying who he's bringing in and then they mount up they all meet up at this castle like place and that they was, get into like a Hawkman's like uh, Tony Stark no, like or <laughs> Professor X. Yeah, seriously, it's a combo. I thought it was strange because I was like, so they're all he, he's he's let, rattling off who he's recruited to be on the team. Um, but you would assume that the Justice Society would have well more than like two newbies and a guy who obviously has worked with Hawkman in the past, but. How how do they not have anybody else? I mean, I'm not complaining in the sense of like, would it have been nice to see other members of the Justice Society? Sure. Or at least hints at other members of the Justice Society? Yeah. But I think that for what it was, I think it was fine. Um I mean, like you, you. It was. It, it's very interesting because, to a degree, the way they played it, where it was like, well, Black Adam is is a villain, and the Justice Society are the heroes, and they've got to take out this villain because that's just what they do. And the way they kind of like play that line of like, well, 
maybe he's not a bad guy or maybe he does bad things but it's for good per- for good reasons and that the the civilian character the the mom or the 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 teacher the professor or whatever uh the way she keeps saying like well no he clearly is helping us he's liberating us from the people that nobody cared about liberating us from in the first place so he's doing something good even if it is bad you know he's using bad methods of doing this and it was smart the way they did that in my opinion because when i look at the character of black adam he is very much that gray area character. He is a villain, but he, to a degree, does things that he believes is important because it matters for his people. So when it comes to the Justice Society, I thought the way it was portrayed initially where they were like, no, 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 we're, we're here to take you in and that's it. Um, it was very cut and dry when I'm sitting here thinking like, well, this does take place in the same universe as when Batman exists. And Batman's not exactly the greatest example of how you know what a hero is and what a villain is considering the stuff we've seen ben affleck's batman do in this universe yeah i loved the uh, the justice society i loved aldous hodge as hawkman pierce brosnan as dr fate i thought they kind of stole the show for me a little like outside of hawkman having a mansion in an underground plane that can the ground opens up like like you said like uh like it's the blackbird from x-men but um I loved how I loved Hawkman and Black Adam's like little rivalry. Like we've seen that in the trailers, like where Hawkman rocks up to Black Adam says heroes don't kill and the rock and Black Adam says, but I do. So I thought that was a cool moment. They had a lot of good fights um, and you, they came to almost kind of like an uneasy truce, like at a couple points in the film, which I thought were, were pretty nice. And um, Adam Smasher, he, I liked how our little random cameo was from Henry Winkler, the Fonz, as uh, passing down the Adam suit to his nephew or grandson or whatever he is. So I thought I kind of geeked out uh, for that. But yeah, I hope we see more of the J- uh, the JSA in the future. Yeah. Um, as far as the villains go, Sabic, I whatever. I you know to me that character is kind of a throwaway. Uh, just like any of the other demon-like characters, like the, uh, I don't even remember who it was in the original Suicide Squad film, but it, to me, it's just another throwaway character. I did like that, uh, how his death was kind of amusing, how he just gets basically ripped in half and turns into lava. Um, I thought it was Trigon. I, th- like, I think I saw a clip in the trail. I was like, oh, Trigon's gonna be in this? Like, from Titans? Like, that's kind of. Now we're getting really wild, but then it was just some thorough way. They did fall into some of, like, um, movie-wise, like, the old comic book tropes of a beam shooting up in the sky and yep. things are coming from. I thought they kind of, I'm like, come on, we still doing this? Like, they should know better by now, but. Well, yeah, even, like, with the, the the Army of the Dead or whatever, it's, like, the same yeah. thing as what they did in Suicide Squad with the little black blob guys or whatever. Um, yeah. So I mean I hope to get I hope to get away from some of this stuff. I mean I, I understand that like when you're establishing certain things, it's hard to establish certain things in such a short amount of time and then still move the story along. But I really hope that we can stop seeing that kind of stuff. Um I will say the weakest point for me for the film was the whole civilian group, uh the mom and the and the son and the mom's brother, uh to me, I, I didn't care for any of it. I understand they were there basically just to move the story along and get to where they needed it to go. But I personally thought that was like the weakest thing. Did I think there were some cool moments with them? Sure. Um, but I felt like the kid was a little bit too head over heels for this idea of this guy who has no problem just you know straight up killing people after he's idolizing people like Superman and Batman and Flash. So like... There's that aspect of it where I thought that was odd because he's not saying, hey, maybe you shouldn't do these things. He does say that, but once he's like, no, no, well, this is what I do, he just accepts it very easily and then just decides, yeah, well, you're going to be the hero for our people and liberate us and whatever. But like the, the civilian stuff, that was probably to me the weakest, but I will say I can see the reason for that being 
a connection to Shazam where there is sort of that family element like we see in Shazam because these characters are, you know, related to a degree. That's not to say that any of these characters are going to be present in the future. I don't know that they will be, but um, that's the only thing I kept telling myself as I was watching it was that, oh, well, they're just doing this and this boy's the, you know, through line for the audience because we're supposed to have this connection that's not you know, just Black Adam or just the Justice Society. They want us, like, in the middle, looking at both sides. So um, what did you think of the civilian stuff? Yeah, that kid was kind of driving me crazy. He was kind of, he's like, like he's Marty McFly on his skateboard uh, evading uh, intergang. Like, I'm like, come on, like, who is this kid? Was he Tony Hawk on this thing? Um, The brother, he was there for uh, comedic... uh, moments he had that good moment with dr fate when um dr fate tells him that he's gonna die by uh electrocution and he's like oh I'm a, but he's like but that's my job like i i work i work with electricity and i thought that was pretty funny um the the woman the mom in the flashbacks i don't know if you noticed this but was she also in the flashbacks too like along with like Black Adam's family, like was she the mom of the in the flashback? Did you notice that, or am I just seeing things? I, uh, I, I don't think it was the same person, but I will say the it looked very similar. The guy who played Ishmael was clearly the same guy who played the king from the old days. Um, Yeah, and I and I caught on that like the second time they showed him, I was like, okay, well, obviously this guy's you know that that guy. That's why he's looking for the the crown. They did not hide it very well that obviously he was in, you know, that he was the big bad that was eventually going to become even a bigger bad. But um, I I don't think she was the 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 mom. I I will say if she was the mom, that would be some that, that would be very that'd be a weird connection. Oh. Yeah, well, quite a coincidence. But I mean, like, all right. So overall, I thought like. I enjoyed the film for what it was. Um, I I think that they told the story, at least the story that I know of, when it comes to Black Adam. They did a good job of telling the story of Black Adam and setting Black Adam to be a character that exists within the DC universe, but doesn't like. I don't think they did a bad job of adapting, you know, the common, the common accepted version of black adam i don't think they did a bad job in any way shape or form um do i think the movie sorry go ahead do you think that maybe um if that black adam was a little too overpowered like he was like in the beginning when he first saw into gang those they were shooting bombs and everything at him and he wasn't even flinching like even superman kind of he like reacts to stuff but like it felt like black adam he was just walking through and like barely getting touched by anything. What do you think about that? Well, I think, see, the thing is that he, I think he's intended to be like that. I think that they did not, that that's in some ways, it's more of a criticism against the way Superman was portrayed initially when he was popping up because he's, they're always making him seem like he's struggling because if he's not struggling, then you don't have any sort of connection. You yeah, know, not instead much of, of a, not, not much of a movie, exactly. So the thing is, like, in a lot of ways, the the weaknesses that Superman has outside of Kryptonite is that he is too good of a person, and he can be easily taken down by like, oh, I've got to save Lois, or I've got to save this other person, but that's going to stop me from being able to do this. Those are the things that like he has to like. And I'm not saying they haven't. Like in Batman vs Superman, he goes after Lois. And in the process, um, some other people die. But the thing is, I don't think they do that. They di- I don't think they did that as well as they could have. With Black Adam, I think they're, in a lot of ways, they're presenting him as this huge, powerful being who will probably, you know, for the most part, keep it keep to his own you know stay out of other people's business as long as other people stay out of where he is which is exactly the way it is in the comics he doesn't really get involved except for when somebody decides hey we're going to put him on the justice league or something like that but i don't think it's far-fetched for him to be as powered as he was i think it's more of a superman needs to be powered just as much so when we see a superman solo film we need to see superman 
just as powerful. Yeah, that made and in this in Black Adam too, they introduced I forget what the name of it was called. It was something that like <clears throat> weakened <clears throat> excuse me, that would weaken Black Adam a little. It was called like uh began with an E. I forgot what it was. I, the um, Eternium. Eternium, yeah. I'd never heard of that, like, but they had that in there and it kinda would kinda they kinda skipped right over that. Yeah, if anything, it's it's gotta be like his kryptonite. I'm completely yeah. unaware of that when it comes to the comics, but I'll be honest, I've not read very many things with Black Adam in it, so I can't speak to it. But like the the crown was made of Eternium and he punched it and then his hand was like that. There was another point where the Eternium rockets blew up next to him and it gave him a wound and that's how he ended up at the the in the kid's bedroom but the thing is like he didn't seem to be too phased by it other than it did knock him out because he ended up waking up seeing that he had the wound and then just fried the wound closed and that was the end of it so like i guess in some ways they're setting up that he does have some sort of weakness but they didn't want to focus too heavily on it because that wasn't the point of the film um i'm fine with it in the sense of like if he has you know his version of kryptonite then i mean it is what it is but they didn't explain why he would have a, you know a weakness to something that's yeah, found they, where he was from. right over it yeah so maybe they're setting it up to be something down the line we'll see um but um yeah like but overall like i said i i, I think it was a good movie for what it was um do I think it was a masterpiece? Absolutely not. Um, I would give it, honestly, like a 3.5 out of 5. That's where my rating would be. I think it's an enjoyable you know, popcorn blockbuster action film. Um, don't go into it expecting some sort of piece of art because it's not that. Um, don't. I, I wouldn't even compare it necessarily to the Batman in the sense of like those are two completely different films. While the Batman had action sequences... This film is a straight action film, while the Batman was more of like a thriller. Um, so I don't compare the two in that sense. As superhero films, the Batman is far superior, in my opinion. Um, besides the fact that it's just Batman, it's just I think it was a better written film, a better story, a better, well acted all around. You know, there's not really any like bits and pieces that you you really feel are completely unnecessary, like there was in this film. But I think a lot of the reason why we had the unnecessary stuff in this film is because they were trying to figure out how to give exposition to certain elements of the story without it being too completely jam-packed. I did appreciate that it was only about two hours, which, I mean, films in general have gotten so long recently. Um, and, and that's not a criticism against films that are long. I, it's a criticism against films that are unnecessarily long. The Batman being three hours, I don't have an issue with that because it was a great film. But, you know, films that I'm sitting down and I'm watching it for two and a half hours and I'm sitting here thinking, like, what was the point of some of the stuff that they had to throw in here? But I didn't feel like that was the case at all. Like, there was stuff that I, I, I didn't enjoy as much, but that doesn't mean that I, I feel like they needed to cut out another half hour of the film because it was because I feel like if they did, it would be detrimental to what they ended up producing. Yeah, I uh, I wrote in my review that like uh, totally. I felt my review was a little light because it wasn't much in terms of plot because there was a lot of action in it and it's tough to write like Hawkman punches Black Adam here, Black Adam punches Hawkman there. But yeah, I think this was. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I'll definitely buy it when it comes out on Blu-ray, and I'll rewatch it and I'll have a great time. Um, it's like I wrote my review. It's uh, baby steps for DC. They needed some positive momentum, and I think they got that with this movie. Yeah, and the film, I mean, it's doing well enough. Um, it was top of the box office two weekends in a row. Uh, that's not to say it's probably going to stay there because Black Panther, uh, the new Black Panther film is right around the corner, um, which is obviously going to eat into you know that. But there's a possibility that it could stick around for a little while and make some more money because there will be the alternative to Black Panther, or there will need to be an alternative to Black Panther. So there is that. Um like VJ said, there is a full review over on the site from him. Be sure to check that out if you want more details on some of the stuff that happens in the film. Um, laying out more specifically some of the, the storyline and things like that. Um, but 
that is going to be it for this episode. Um, hopefully, you guys enjoyed us talking about Black Adam. Obviously, the DC news and the uh, the Batman TV series that that uh, the news that we've got from those. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. What did you guys think of Black Adam? What did you guys think of the news related to James Gunn and Peter Safran taking over DC Studios or the newly formed DC Studios? Uh, we'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Um, we are contemplating an idea here in the future, but at this point, we don't get a lot of interaction with you guys. But if you are listening, we encourage you to interact because one of the things I'd like to do in the future is do like a mailbag where you guys do, you guys send us questions and we answer the questions that you guys ask as a, as an episode or even a segment of an episode or things like that. So be sure to interact with us uh, wherever you are listening to the podcast, whether it be on YouTube, on the website, um, and podcast players. All the comments that you leave wherever you're listening to it, they all do get filtered back to us. So we do get we do see that stuff. Also, chime in with the discussion over on Discord um, and chat with other Bat fans. There's always conversations going on with all kinds of stuff and news related to the Batman universe. Um, outside of that, be sure to check out our website, thebatmanuniverse.net, for all kinds of news, original content, reviews, and other podcasts related to the Batman universe that cover movies, television, video games, merchandise, comics, and everything else related to the Bat fandom. Be sure to check us out on social media. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Discord. You can find all of our social links at the top of the page over at thebatmanuniverse.net. You can send us an email at tbu at um, you can, with any ideas, comments, anything like that. Um, and we're, we, we always appreciate your guys' support. Listening to the episode obviously helps us out in general, um, but if you're interested in supporting us in any other way, just check out the website. There's a bunch of different ways you guys can support us, including using our affiliate links at a variety of different um, online stores uh, while you're doing your holiday shopping because we do get a little bit of uh, a commission off of that stuff and it doesn't cost you guys anything. It just helps us out. So be sure to check that out as well. So with all that being said, for BJ and myself, thank you guys so much for listening to this episode and we'll see you guys next time. Mm-hmm.